I went out of that building and went to go to the other building. And as soon as I walked out of that first building and looked up, it was no longer smoke that I saw, it was fire. Uh, so I got up and I parted the, the uh, shades in the window and saw a wall of flame. It was just on the other side of the uh, entry driveway to the apartment complex. The, the brush and the homes behind it were completely engulfed. My name is Jennifer Nyheis. I'm the CEO at Vista Del Mar Hospital. So Vista Del Mar is a behavioral health hospital. Um, we have inpatient services and outpatient services. So we um, care for those de uh, dealing with mental health issues, behavioral health issues, um, chemical dependency, substance abuse issues. Well, I actually am from Michigan and I um, was in Chicago for about 10 years. I started working for a company there in the hospital there and um, I'm LCSW, so I'm a social worker background. Went to Jane Addams School in Chicago and started working in the social services department at a hospital. And really started seeing opportunities of ways that we could improve systems and do better for the patients in the hospital. And so in that, with that passion that I found, started to move up into more administrative positions. And so that same company moved me to Pasadena. I was there for a year and then um, now moved here to Ventura uh, year, one year ago. Right before the fire, we had 87 patient beds. Due to the fire, um, we now will be coming back online with 55 inpatient beds. We also, as I mentioned, have outpatient services, and that entails a five-day-a-week program and a three-day-a-week program. So it's intensive outpatient. It's not just like a typical you know, weekly therapist session. Um, there's expressive therapy groups. There's you know, a psychiatrist who's available as needed. There's nurses and dietitian, uh, all kinds of different services depending on the need of the patients. Uh, many of our patients come to us because, you know, they're having experiencing depression that, you know, just not seeming to be able to get out of it, different other uh, psychosis, just challenges in being able to function in their lives due to mental health issues, um, and also due to substance abuse issues, which, you know, sometimes do coincide. And so, um, you know, when, when those things are, are occurring and they come to the point of a crisis situation where there's really not much more that can be done in like a, a traditional outpatient setting, maybe that's been tried, but things continue to escalate. Family members start to notice different signs and symptoms or, um, you know, or, or they voice those concerns. And so that's why we're there for the, the, the crisis, the immediate need to really help to, to treat and care so we can get people back on their feet to live, live healthy and complete lives. The night of the fire, I was leaving the office and my CNO and Director of Clinical Services were still there and they were starting to send some messages to me that, you know, the moon is red, we, we hear there's a fire out in Santa Paula, but, you know, and me being new to the area, I'd only been here six months and I'm looking in Google Maps, where's Santa Paula? And, and once again, from the Midwest, so this is the first time I, you know, really had ever experienced a fire, a wildfire in general. and so. We were texting, this was probably around 8 o'clock, 9, 10, and it was about 10.30. And so I went outside and I looked up and I saw just the glowing hills. And the hospital, I don't know if you've been out there, but it's right on, on top of a hill. Um, it's surrounded by hills. Beautiful setting, you know, not ideal for that night. And seeing that, I, I just let them know I said we need to head in and just be there because you know just the staff were getting a little nervous I had one staff member call me directly and so I just said we're coming in so we drove in we got there around it was probably around 11 30 uh, December 4th and when we when we arrived you could see the smoke coming over the hills and so I went into one building started talking to the staff in there and said you know we need to start preparing for evacuation I don't know if we're going to at this point but we need to be ready and then I went out of that building because we have five, we had five buildings, we have three now. I went out of that building and went to go to the other building. And as soon as I walked out of that first building and looked up, it was no longer smoke that I saw, it was fire. And so once again, new to, new to wildfires, not really understanding much about it, but seeing the winds 
And so just, just putting that together, these winds are coming rapidly. I now just saw smoke, now I see flames. Talked to, to my director of clinical services who was in that building with our patients. Everyone was feeling anxious, um, including myself. And we made the call, we, we need to get, get out of here and make sure everyone's safe. We had 70 patients, 25 staff members, and our, our vans utilized for transportation were way up on the hill where it was a place where it was not necessarily safe to go get. We had emergency plans in place to utilize services in the community that at that point were not available to us. We escorted the, the patients with the staff out to our cars and the original evacuation place that we normally would go to was also being evacuated. So found our way to, to the fairgrounds along with, with the other patients and the staff. We're able to set up kind of an area there, try to keep it as private as possible, but then we began um, Either we had a psychiatrist come in who could help us with discharges, but for those who are not safe yet to discharge or who are not ready to, to go home, um, working out transportation. And we had several hospitals, two of our sister facilities, uh, Bakersfield Behavioral and um, Los Encinas in Pasadena, they had vans there by 6 a.m. that morning helping us to, to get patients to safety. The community just came together and the county, EMS, you know, I mean, I could go on and on naming how many people were just incredible that night of just, what do you need? We're here, we're gonna help. And by two o'clock on December 5th, all of our patients were either able to be discharged home or were other facilities safely. I am just so grateful every single day that, sorry, I get emotional, that every patient and staff member was out there safely. It was such a remarkable thing that in the midst of the storm, there was such peace. And we all, we all reflected that. You know, all of the, the directors and staff members and nurses and, you know, LVNs and mental health workers who said, stepped up to the plate and said, come in my car, I'm gonna take you to safety. So by 2 a.m. on the morning of December 5th, the actual hospital building had caught fire. Complete sadness sense as there are several buildings involved here at the Vista Del Mar Hospital and all of them are burning. I didn't find this out until much later. We, we ended up leaving there right around midnight. So, I mean, it was, it was really close. So remarkable. If you happen to see it, and I know that there are, there's some footage out there. We did some drone coverage of what was destroying the debris and all of that. But there's a building up on the hill Hill that that remains. There's another building that was completely burned and destroyed. The administration building up front was completely burned and destroyed, but then we have two other buildings behind it that remain. I mean, it's just, it was the wind, the, the fire, the way the palm trees were carrying this. I mean, just incredible to see that. Um, but, but two of our buildings, one a patient care building, one our administration building, burned completely to the ground. And, and, and I didn't know that, we didn't know that as we were just focused, we needed to take care of our patients. That next morning I thought, I thought it was all gone. And I was so relieved to know there were three buildings standing. And that was, there was some hope there. We right now are working ferociously to get the utilities back to the campus. Our water pump was destroyed. All of our generator, ATS, we, so all of that equipment was destroyed. And so to get that back up and running isn't as simple as just replacing it because there's, you know, underground wires and piping and, you know, all of these things that we need to, to make sure that are appropriate and ready to go safely and have to go through all of the regulatory bodies that make sure that we do stay safe. And so in doing that, that has taken quite a while, but we are pushing forward. Our, our motto is every day matters. And that's something we're gonna put up in our cafeteria. Every day matters because every day matters for, for us and what we do every day to utilize every minute, but also it matters for our patients who are, you know, will be needing the care that we provide and, and our community who, uh, you know, is lacking this important resource right now that, you know, having to drive all the way to Bakersfield or Los Angeles or things like that, that I can't imagine, you know, having uh, my own daughter needing care and having to drive hours just to go visit every day. So we will have, you know, ideally more beds than we had before, which is great because there's such a, there was such a lack already. And, uh, in the community. And so collaborating with uh, Venturi County Behavioral Health and local CEOs who have, I mean, have been incredible. For me being new to this community, I am just so grateful that, that I'm here. That this, I just feel like this is meant to be, this is where I'm supposed to be right now. I would say the takeaways from this are, one, understanding that what were the work, the critical aspect of the work that we do. And I think sometimes we take for granted and not just me as, you know, one of the leaders, but as every single nurse on the floor, 
as every single mental health worker caring for our patients. That if, yes, it's a job. Yes, you know, we're, we're coming to work every day and those kind of things, but this is such a critical need. We're saving lives. And that is something that I knew and it's the passion of why I do what I do. But going through this and hearing the community and hearing some devastating stories of what the result has been of us being closed. That is something I think that will motivate me, you know, for the rest of my career. So, and just, just know that what, what we're doing is, is saving lives and, and so no matter what we have to go through, it's worth it and we can get through it. I'm Lance Corthals. I was a resident at the Hawaiian Village apartment complex, which as you know, is no longer. It's 53 units that are now a big pile of ash. That day was kind of interesting in that uh, at 10 o'clock, uh, we lost power. I didn't know at the time it was because of the problems in Santa Paula. I actually went out on my deck. I had a two bedroom townhouse that uh, has a 180 degree view of Ventura and the ocean. And I went out of the deck and I sat there and Ventura was completely black, except for a few cars running back and forth. And I just thought to myself how serene this was. And eventually I got bored and I went to bed. No phone calls, no knocks on the door. At around 12.30 in the morning, I just woke up. And I noticed there was a kind of an odd glow in the room. Uh, so I got up and I parted the, the uh, shades in the window and saw a wall of flame. It was just on the other side of the uh, entry driveway to the apartment complex. The, the brush and the homes behind it were completely engulfed. Ran downstairs, got my wallet, my phone, my keys, thought to myself, well, I may be spending the night in my car. So I grabbed a jacket and a hat. I go outside and the first thing that I saw besides the flames that was the wall on the other side was a couple of palm trees that were on fire. And uh, the one that was most notable to me was, uh, you know how most palm trees are really tall? This one was kind of short and squat. And where the palm fronds break off and fall over that, that section right there, that was absolutely glowing uh, orange. And sparks were just shooting off uh, from it. And the thing that I actually thought at that time was, now imagine the scene, glowing background, black sky, tree with sparks. I went. This is really beautiful. So I looked around, tried to assess how many, how, what my options were, and decided there was enough time to go bang on doors. So I just started yelling and banging on doors as, as best I could for a while. And then I said, okay, nobody's coming out. So I went out um, to my car, and not far from my car was a trailer that, uh, it was a wooden trailer, where I was talking about the palm fronds falling, where they would gather them and put the fr palm fronds in this trailer. It was in flames. Fortunately, it was about 20 yards from where my car was, so I could get my car out. Still decided I had enough time. And I drove up and down the, the parking lot, honking my horn and, and yelling to see if there was anybody there. At that point, I uh, determined, well, I didn't see any anybody coming out, so it's time to leave. Now by this time, the, 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 the fire had jumped from the other side of the driveway to our side of the driveway, and the parts of the carport were starting to catch on fire as well. So I, I start going up, <laughs> I start going up the driveway. There's, there's walls of flame on both sides, and just as I get about halfway up, you know how windy it was. It's a big gust of wind from the right blows fire into the driveway, and I drove around it, fortunately, and, and, and got out. And at the top of the hill was the, the apartment manager and a fireman in a fire truck who was just standing there because there was no water pressure, and they couldn't do anything. Interestingly, this whole time, there was no panic. I, had not, I was not panicked, I was not afraid, I was just calculating what to do. And so I told the guy, I mean, I couldn't get anybody to come out. He said, they're already gone, you're the last one. The apartment manager later told me that I will for, I, I remember these words, I, you will be forever etched in my mind as the last one out. 
So I headed down to the fairgrounds and uh, spent the first night there. There was a lot going on. Some people were freaked out. But around 4.30 in the morning, I got a text from my next door neighbor who sent me a photograph, a close-up of our uh, joined balconies, completely engulfed. It was a close-up and it was, <laughs> I kind of said, uh, well, I guess I don't have any place to go back home to. Because I had naively thought when I first came out, well, you know, the palm trees are on fire, but that's all right now, and maybe, maybe it'll be okay. Boy, was I wrong. At that point, I went, okay, what do I have to do next? For some reason, I have this ability to go from something that happens that's really bad, process it reasonably quickly, this particular one was very quick, and, that, and then, then say, what do I have to do next? So I started making a list of things I have to do. And about the third thing that I wrote down in my, in my phone was stop payment on rent check, which I did the next morning. To me, there's, there's, you, you have to look at it pragmatically, and also I, I tend to find the humor in things, even though it's a terrible situation, but hey, that's past. So we have to look, how do we, how do we go forward? I also decided that it's time now to let my mother know uh, that I'm okay. Now, little backstory, my mother is 90 years old, lives in uh, the suburb of Detroit, and she's one of those people that when there's a fire in California, I mean, all Californians live in the same place. So it's like, hi, I, I've heard there's a fire in California. Is that near you? No, no, mom, mom, that's, that's near San Francisco. We're in Southern California. So she called, I call her, I should say, and I said, hey, mom, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm fine. You know how you always call me when there's a, a fire in California and ask me if it's close to me? She goes, yeah. And I say, well, there's a fire in California, and it's kind of close to me. In fact, it's so close that my apartment complex burned down. And I think it was the lilt in my voice and the positive nature in which I said it that she was surprised, to be sure, but fine. She didn't freak out, and that was a big thing to me because I didn't want my mother just going out of her mind. I said I was fine, and et cetera, and I lost everything, but that's, that's the way it goes. And also that night, I, I coined a phrase that I have used ever since, which I think tells my truth about the situation, because I have not shed a single tear about the stuff I lost. And what I say to people is, I lost everything except my spirit. And that bears truth to today. I've met more people uh, from the Hawaiian village than I knew when I lived there for nine and a half years. I mean, I knew some of the immediate people next to me and such, and I knew some by sight, uh, but uh, we've gotten to know each other a lot better. One of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that I'm here actually to tell the story is to let people know that we're not all doom and gloom. As I think I've mentioned to you before, and maybe you're getting a sense of it, that I'm, I'm generally positive, generally take the, if there's a sense of humor to it, look, look at that. But it's not always like that. I mean, certainly, this is a, as I, as I like to put it, it's, it's just a task. It's a gigantic task, but it's just a task. And it is wearing. It is 24-7, uh, and uh, I do, there is a sense of now and then overwhelm that happens to it, but not in a way that is debilitating, not depressing. I don't get depressed. Some people have. I've seen people that, that have been, been very devastated and uh, you know everybody reacts differently and I can only tell my story and my truth. But I get, uh, I, I, what I've learned to do was to listen to my mind and listen to my body and when it's enough, I stop. Because there, there was a time there in the, in the early days where it went from planning minute to minute to hour by hour to half day but to ha and it's gradually stretched out where now that I finally moved into a more permanent residence, I'm almost having a, a, a letdown, like this massive amounts of planning uh, to get to this point is like, okay, now I'm here. Now what? 
And so the next phase of, of planning is, is starting to happen. I listened to myself and said, okay, take a break. You need to just chill a little bit and then take a breath and then figure out how to go forward. Thankfully, friends, family, uh, community have been fantastically supportive. My favorite story, uh, stories about this whole thing have to do not with loss, but with the random acts of kindness of strangers and a preponderance of positive things that happened for me since the fire. Two days after the, the fire, I get a call from my former business partner's family, and he had passed away in July and they had put all his belongings in a storage facility. They called me and said, hey, we're going up there uh, to Thousand Oaks to the storage facility and emptying it out, and we're gonna take this, that, and the other thing, and there's a few other things left, and if you, I need this, they described some of it to me. And they uh, uh, said, if you'd like it, you know, you're a friend of the family, please come and get it. Here's my entire existence. Here's a bag from Red Cross, here's a bag of food, and here's a bag of sock, socks and underwear. So that was it until then. A friend of mine and I go out, we get the stuff, and it included a dresser, nightstands, TV, computer. So uh, after, uh, my friend that helped me with this, I take him and his wife out for dinner. So we're sitting at uh, the restaurant, uh, actually at the bar, on the corner of a bar. I'm on one corner, my buddy's on the other corner, and his wife is next to him. And I was in a great mood, because I had just gotten all this great stuff. I'm happy to be alive. I'm generally a, a, a positive person. And this was gonna be the first martini that I had since the fire, and I'm a martini man. So the bartender came up and got our orders, and I ordered a martini, and, and I was all excited, telling him, you know, I'm, I'm getting a martini, this is fantastic. Funds were a little, little tight at the moment, so uh, I ordered a happy hour. So when the bartender comes and brings me the martini, she says, well, here's your order, but it's not a, a well martini, it's a Bombay Sapphire martini, courtesy of these folks over here. There was a couple sitting next to my uh, the friends who had overheard our conversation. And uh, so I was, you know, well, thank you. And I got up and I, I went over and I, I uh, talked to them and basically told them the story that I've, I've told you uh, thus far. And, uh, and they were just uh, enthralled and, and uh, they were, and David and Michelle, that's all I knew. Uh, and uh, they, they told, uh, said how inspirational I was and what a great attitude I had uh, and were very impressed. And so we talked, blah, blah, blah. And then finally the, top, the conversation finished. I went back, we ate, they ate. Uh, and uh, so uh, they finished obviously before we did and they got up and left. And then the bartender comes up to me and says, they didn't want to give this to you until they left and handed me a gift card for $200. That's the stuff that gets me. That's the stuff that gets me. Not the loss, but the acts of change. I didn't know these people at all. I still don't. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna maybe try and find them. But it's that kind of thing that brings us together.